Caixa Racha León, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias a todos por haber venido. Thank you very much for coming. Um, bienvenidos a, a Chialecu para dar para inaugurar y dar um, comienzo a estas jornadas de rizoma que se engloban dentro de la Bienal Mugac de Arquitectura del País Vasco. Contamos aquí también con María. Muchas gracias por, eh, por acompañarnos hoy. Eh, la verdad es que estamos eh, muy ilusionados de acoger y ser partícipes junto con eh, Egoin Groupwood de estas, de estas jornadas, pues sin duda estamos en un marco ideal para, para hablar de arquitectura y como muchos de vosotros sabéis, pues Eduardo Chillida tuvo una relación y una, y una vida siempre ligada a la arquitectura desde esos primeros estudios que él, que él siguió hasta estas fantásticas colaboraciones, ya sea con Joaquín Montero para hacer el caserío o con, o con Peña Ganchegui para hacer estos proyectos que tenemos en, en, el, en, el, en el País Vasco o, o, o muchas de sus obras ¿no? que nos invitan a habitar. Eh, habitar la, la escultura. La verdad es que esperemos que esto sea el inicio de, de un proyecto que tenga, que tenga, eh, que tenga continuidad y, y, y la verdad es que, para, como he comentado, eh, me acompaña a mi derecha eh, una Yagui Red, CEO de, de Goin, muchas gracias por, por estar aquí, y Victoria Collar, que es eh, una de las... Eh, eh, comisarias de la, de, la, de la exposición ahora y de las jornadas. Eh, como decía, eh, estas jornadas Rizoma eh, tienen lugar o eh, son posibles por esta unión con, con Egoin, una, una empresa eh, de, de madera de, desde hace más de 30 años, ¿verdad? En, en Vizcaya, para que después digan que Vizcaya y Guipúzcoa no hacen, no hacen proyectos. Y, y de ahí ha nacido no solo estas jornadas, estas charlas, sino también un, un proyecto expositivo que habéis podido ver en la Sala 1 y que también nos introducirán un poco, un poco más tarde. Eh, os, os quería también contar, bueno, le pasaremos primero la palabra a Unai y luego hablamos de los, de los comisarios. Gracias, Unai. Muchas gracias, Mireia. Eh, es que recasco. Bueno, eh, Proyecto hau, guretzat hau soberezia da, oso ilusia, asko enten gaituen proyecto bada. Ze, guretzat e, sustraietara, oinarretara voltatzea bezala da, ez da. E, egoin orain hogeita mala urte jaio zan, baserri batean. E, eta baser gintzan, e, baserrin erainkuntzan e, sortu zan, ez da. E, Horregaitik guretzat oso, oso berezia da, ze gure oinarretara voltatzen gara nola bait, ez da. E, eh, decía que es un proyecto para nosotros muy especial, muy ilusionante. Eh, empezamos, eh, la razón de Goines es construcción industrializada de madera, eso es, eso es lo que nosotros nos dedicamos. Empezamos hace 34 años, eh, orientados al caserío, eh, industrializando la construcción en los caseríos. Eh, éramos pioneros en aquella época. Eh, no hacíamos nada especial, copiábamos a los, eh, a los europeos y aquí era muy, muy especial, ¿no? Pero todo, todo rondaba alrededor del caserío. ¿no? Eh, si visitáis Egoin en Achitua, las oficinas están en un caserío y ese fue el punto de, de partida. ¿no? El, ha cambiado mucho la construcción en esos 34 años. Ha evolucionado los procesos de industrialización, los materiales, eh, las soluciones constructivas, la propia madera. Antes construíamos con madera maciza, ahora vamos a madera mucho más tecnológica. Antes traíamos especies eh, europeas, ahora ya hemos conseguido certificar las especies de Euskadi, trabajamos la madera local. Eh, hemos evolucionado muchísimo en todo este camino, ¿no? eh, pero la base, nuestra base sigue siendo el, el Baserri, sigue siendo la, la construcción de las unifamiliares, que, que sigue suponiendo pues, un 40% de lo, de lo que hacemos en Egoin. Hacemos luego cosas muy espectaculares que, que podéis ver, eh, hacemos edificios muy arquitectónicos, eh, edificios residenciales en altura eh, y aquí hay algunos maestros que luego nos, nos podrán explicar lo que están haciendo en madera, que es auténticamente espectacular. ¿no? Pero el castillo sigue siendo 
todavía el origen, ¿no? el origen que nos dice, que nos habla de una construcción y una arquitectura funcional, una arquitectura sostenible, eh, con materiales locales y muy ligada a lo que es el diseño y lo que es el arte. ¿no? Y este es un ejemplo fantástico de, 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 de esto, que es eh, un caserío eh, reutilizado eh, y en todos los sentidos. ¿no? Eh, un lujo colaborar con, con nuestros socios, eh, en este caso, eh, que nos han dado mucho dinamismo y, y un lujo el, el colaborar con, con Chidialecu, eh, Mireia, Miquel, muchísimas gracias por, por el entorno, por lo que supone esto como referente de, de, de un proyecto y, y bueno, también muchísimas gracias a la Bienal, que con estamos colaborando mucho y seguiremos colaborando los próximos años seguro. ¿no? Eh, es que ricasco, Danoy. Gracias. Pues pasaré a presentar a los comisarios con quien han preparado este, esta serie de coloquios Rizoma, que nos contarán mucho más ellos, pero presento a, a Victoria Collar, que me acompaña, y en este caso con John Garbizu, que son arquitectos por la Chat de Barcelona. Victoria trabajó durante seis años en, en Basilea, en la oficina con premio Pritzker, Herzog y Meurón. Por otro lado, John trabajó también en, durante seis años en Basilea para Buckner Plunder Architecten. Actualmente ambos desarrollan su actividad profesional a través de su despacho eh, Garbizu Collar, con sede tanto en Suiza como en España, y lo compaginan con la docencia en el ETH de, de Zúrich. Uh, Gonzalo Peña, uh, arquitecto por la CHAM de Madrid, trabajó durante cuatro años también en Basilea para eh, Herzog y Meurón. En 2020 funda CRI, una plataforma interdisciplinar con sede en Madrid, Gonzalo ha sido premiado en distintos concursos, realizando distintas publicaciones y actividades académicas en la CHAM y en la Universidad Abierta Interamericana en Rosario, Argentina. Y por último eh, tenemos a Diego, a Diego Sologuren, es arquitecto que estudió en la ECHA de San Sebastián y en el St. Lucas Brussels University, donde se involucró en un máster de estudios urbanos. Desde su graduación ha desarrollado la carrera en diversos países, incluyendo Bélgica, Francia, Alemania, España y África. Y en 2014 se unió a la oficina de Francis Queré, donde aprendió sobre la importancia de la honestidad, la economía de medios y la simplicidad formal en la arquitectura y el diseño. Lidera su propio estudio, buscando innovar en arquitectura mediante la integración de diferentes disciplinas y, explor y explorando nuevos usos y funciones del espacio arquitectónico. Una gran chuleta que me ha servido para hacer esta introducción. Un aplauso para ellos, por supuesto. Y Victoria, cuéntanos un poco más sobre Rizoma y sobre el artefacto que hemos visto. Hola a todos, muchas gracias por venir. Estamos muy agradecidos de que hayáis sacado tiempo y mostrado interés en acompañarnos en esta primera sesión de Rizoma. En primer lugar, me gustaría agradecer a todos los que han hecho posible que hoy estemos aquí. A Egoín, una y muchas gracias por habernos apoyado desde el principio y haber hecho realidad la pequeña locura del artefacto junto a todo el equipo de montaje. Ha sido bastante divertido. A Chilla Aleku, Mireya y Miquel, muchas gracias por acogernos en vuestra casa, también al resto del equipo que nos habéis propuesto soñar y haber hecho que este proyecto creciera de manera rizomática. Luego también a César Garbalena, que no ha podido asistir hoy, pero hizo posible que poner, poner en marcha esta maquinaria. Por otro lado, a MUGAC y al Departamento de Planificación Territorial, Vivienda y Transporte del Gobierno Vasco. Pablo, no he visto antes. <risa> María, muchas gracias al resto del equipo que habéis valorado Rizoma de manera positiva para formar parte de esta cuarta edición de la Bienal Internacional de Arquitectura. Bueno. Entonces, ¿qué es Rizoma? Rizoma es un ensayo colectivo en el que invitamos a artistas, arquitectos e investigadores a debatir y compartir con el público general indagaciones y paradigmas sobre cómo imaginar el mundo rural contemporáneo y así abrir nuevos posibles a través de la desmitificación del baserri, del caserío vasco. Rizoma se articula en un programa estructurado en cuatro actos. El primero, el de hoy, se llama ASC, quiere decir comenzar, el segundo SOR, crear, ver, rehacer, reactivar, reutilizar y bis, bis habitar. 
Eh, hoy inauguramos Rizoma con el primer acto, AS, un encuentro titulado Lurra, que significa tierra, término que define el planeta que contiene la vida que conocemos, pero que también hace referencia a la identidad de un lugar y sobre todo a la superficie, a la sustancia que alberga esa vida. La tierra ejemplifica el comienzo y por ello vemos imprescindible que la tierra sea la base y el inicio de Rizoma. Para ello, perdón, para ello y contamos con dos grandes inspiradores arquitectos, Roger Boltzhauser y José Mateus. Por un lado, el trabajo de Roger aspira a contribuir y a mejorar el medio ambiente a todos los niveles. Desde el principio de su carrera ha participado en el desarrollo de la investigación técnica, el desarrollo de materiales como la construcción en tierra compactada. Su trabajo lo desarrolla tanto en instituciones públicas como la ETH de Zúrich o su despacho profesional Boltzhauser Architecten. Por otro lado, José Mateus es fundador y presidente de la Trinidad de Arquitectura de Lisboa, una institución de prestigio en la esfera arquitectónica mundial contemporánea. Una trinal que aborda problemáticas actuales y que sirve de plataforma de difusión para jóvenes y no tan jóvenes arquitectos. Estamos convencidos que tienen mucho que compartir y mucho que aportar a esta primera jornada. Así que sin extenderme más, paso a saludarles y a darles la palabra. Bueno, eh, zuerst, liebe Roger, merci vielmals fürs Kommen. Wir sind überzeugt, dass du extrem viel beizutragen hast und setzen wir extrem, dass du hier heute bist. Merci vielmals. Dear Jose, obrigada. Thank you very much for coming today. And the whole Rizoma team feels extremely grateful and happy for your time and interest in our topic. We are grateful that you both are here today. So I give you the word. Uh, <coughs> I can have to utilize this. Buenas tardes, uh, Arachal de Hon. <laughs> and um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak in English. Uh, I'm able to speak Portuñol, but in order to Roger understand, I'm going to do this talk uh, in English. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, the foundation and, uh, and the curators of this program. Uh, Vitoria, John, Gonzalo, Diego, thank you so much. Mireia, thank you so much. It's a big pleasure to be here today representing the Lisbon Triennale in such an amazing place. Um, surrounded by the work of the great master Chilida, which is uh, really inspiring for Portuguese architecture and a lot respected on our country. Thank you so much. Um, on our sixth edition, um, under the title Terra, the Lisbon Architecture Triennale decided to research and disseminate how we can think, how we can design and build, but with a sustainable relation with the earth. Um, this edition was also a kind of global call to a sense of urgency, a call to a sense of action. Um, and this, this, uh, this presentation that I'm going to share with you, it's a lot inspired and informed by all the process of Terra. For millions of years, our planet has evolved to the uh, Holocene era by creating ideal conditions, uh, biosphere, ecosystems, the balance perfect for the life in harmony, and finally, human civilizations, till the humans gradually start to leave their mark. 
Everything started with the slow migratory path of, of Homo sapiens across the globe. Started, they started a kind of a war against the planet. And this is an expression that I heard a lot of times during the program um, of uh, Terra uh, Edition. And um, through this path, um, the, the, the Homo sapiens started to impose um, uh, a big impact started with the extinction of species, namely, namely the megafauna. And then with the European planetary navigations, namely uh, by the Spanish, Portuguese, English navigations, who start the process, process of globalization. Until today's exponential acceleration, that is imposing an intensive exploration, exploration of natural resources that provoked irreversible damages, environmental damages that got us into deeply unreliable grounds. That is evolving much faster than the solutions that humankind are coming up with. The behavior of, of the planet is now dictated by the careless human interference on the laws of nature. So it became common to name this new era as the Anthropocene. Like uh, Alexei Pavlov did in 1922, and later Paul Crutzen in 2000, they proposed to name as Anthropocene. And we must urgently change the way we relate with the planets. Analyzing the various biophysical indicators of the Earth, a group of scientists led by Johan Rockström and Will Steffen defined what would be the nine planetary borders that we should respect, that we should not cross. And um, this uh, report that was published last September by the Stockholm Resil Resilience Center uh, concluded that, uh, that we already uh, have crossed uh, the limit in six of the limits, and we are about to cross the limit on ocean acidification. And as for the also widely discussive, uh, discussed excessive concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, we uh, understand through these uh, sequences of, um, of um, moments from 2009 to 2023 that the conditions of the, of the, of the Earth are um, worsening really, really fast. These are the, the six limits that we have already crossed, and as I told, only um, one limit um, we have we had the capacity to recover that was the um, the, um, the, um, the layer of ozone that is protecting the atmosphere and the and the and the and the, um, the, the planet from the excessive uh, exposition to the radiation of sun this is the the scenario now as we can see the evolution uh, it's now going really fast. When we should be reducing the emissions, we are still increasing. And so, uh, to understand the scale of the problem right now, we have 40% more CO2 in the atmosphere than we had before the Industrial Revolution. 51 billion tons per year of greenhouse gases, it's what we are emitting right now to the atmosphere. And so, the results is the climate change, as we all know, and the impacts of this climate change. CO2 also provokes the acidification of the oceans through the death, the death of coral uh, reefs with a big imp impact on maritime ecosystems and oxygen production. Since the oceans are the largest producer of oxygen in the planet, the prospects are really highly worrying. And then we have um, affirmations like this of Michel Jarreau. And this is our reality today. And may I add the occurrence of uncontrolled megafires. Another consequence is the glaciers melting with, progressive, with their progressive disappearance. And what people don't convey is that um, the, is besides or beyond the rising water levels, the ice surfaces are crucial to reflect sunbeams. 
And this is really important to avoid excessive heat absorption by the planet. And so, if we have less reflection, we have more absorption. And this creates what is called a negative reinforcing feedback loop that increases fast the towing. As an example, in Greenland alone, around 300 billion tons of ice disappear every, every year. And how, how did we get here? It's not changing. Ah, okay. How did we get here? Such words could be understood today as a nomen of what humankind would later lay down on Earth. If, uh, uh, and when I, I read this phrase, I can, I can uh, have the idea that uh, the, um, the humankind isolated only the part that says right over nature. And so the humans impose, rather than a sense of belonging, of protecting, of taking care of, uh, of the nature, humankind decided to impose domination, unlimited exploration of the earth in general, of all the resources. And um, even if they read a, a bit more what, uh, what Francis Bacon wrote, they could, they could have, uh, have uh, wrote this. But even so, humankind apparently only retained the idea of commands without trying to clearly understand the nature, uh, the nature laws. Like many naturalists who were already emerging do, during those times uh, did, knowledge that was, uh, that was widely shared with everyone that could, uh, that could uh, uh, understand the way we should relate with, uh, with nature in general. The factors of impact, we know uh, lots of them. I'm going just to, to, to list a few ones. Of course, we got here by destroying ecosystems, extinguishing species, and destroying ancient forests. To give you an idea, only in 2018, uh, humans destroyed 4 million hectares of ancient forests. In 2018. Systema by the systematic use of non-renewable energy, by using fossil fuels on a the, on the big scale, using finite, uh, finite earth resources, through intensive agriculture and livestock farming, through the use of widespread use of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers, by impact industrial fishing, by the implementation of polluting land, sea, and air mobility, through the intense global trade, by designing buildings in cities that require large displacements and that are enormous machines of water and energy consumption, waste production, and so on and so on. And when we see the impact visible worldwide, particularly in the most vulnerable and less developed countries, that due to their extreme natural conditions, adverse socioeconomic settings, they are much more exposed to the impacts of climate change. This is, a, this is an example which, that we all should know. In Syria, where the most uh, severe drought in 500 years led to the collapse of the family farming uh, economy and then uh, led to a violent demographic and humanitarian crisis. And this, is, was, this was a crucial reason for the social upheavals that preceded the war. And this was the result. But nobody talks about that. And in Africa, in Africa we find the same. Like the well-known journalist from New York Times, Thomas Friedman, said in one of his books, the expansion of the world of disorder is a story of climate desertification and demographics in Africa from where overcrowded boats of refugees who try to escape from this chaos depart towards Europe. And to have an idea, in 2050, it's expected, expected that one-fourth of the world population is going to be African. And after hundreds of years of European colonialism and uh, decades of independence and uh, economic expansion, 
we still find in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, more than 400 million people that don't have access to steady electricity. And we find more than 190 million people in 10 countries that don't have access to sanitation and drinkable water. And so, when we plan solutions, it's really important that people from Europe and North America have the conscience that uh, more than half of the CO2 stored in the, in the atmosphere was emitted by Europe and North America. So we have a moral obligation when we deal with, that, with those countries that are more fragile. The seminal and revealing book limits to grow and the limit and the, the 30 year update. This book was written by a group of scientists uh, and was published originally in 1972 at the request of the Club of Rome. Based on data generated by their software computer World 3, in this book they compare three different scenarios of the future evolution of the planet depending on different responses from the humankind. From the fastest and widest to the slowest and more limited. The most optimi optimistic version clearly shows that during the 21st century, the conditions of life are going to change a lot. The worst scenario reveals environment and life conditions collapse. And one thing is highlighted several times in this book is that there is a sense of urgency because the more time it passes, the less room to maneuver humankind has. So we need to go forward rap uh, rapidly because it's not fair to, uh, that we leave this uh, really heavy um, challenge to the children or the generations to come. But we have to think, when we start to think about how do we overcome this problem, that is complex but possible. I've mentioned before the recovery of the ozone layer, that it's not completely recovered, but it's on the way to be recovered. But I think that architects in general have the privilege the possibility to find an opportunity in these moments to invent new languages with specific responses to this complex situation. And I think this is an, an extraordinary work. To me, it's a fantastic possibility to reinvent the way we design architecture. And of course, when we see the measurements of the origin of the CO2 emissions, of course, it, it is energy, production of energy and consumption of energy in the center. And um, it's important when we spoke, speak about uh, emissions to see this graphic. This graphic is a lot related with the book, The Limits to Grow. In fact, what shows is that on the higher and darker line, we see what is going to happen if we don't do nothing, or if we do nothing. It's not what we're going to get in the end of the 21st century, almost plus five degrees Celsius. So it's better that we think that we need to work to the other two lines. Uh, and uh, pre uh, preferentially, I would say, uh, the lower line, where we start to recover uh, fast the situation. And the basis of man, mankind's great industrial advances, of course, it was energy. More powerful and efficient energy in greater quantity and cost effectiveness. During the Industrial Revolution, all, all of us know that we replaced muscle strength by steam engine. And we had then the explosion engine. And we built many, uh, many highly polluting coal power plants to produce electricity that still are one of the most important ways of producing electricity around the world. And it's not a coincidence that in the end, in this uh, first activist album of Pink Floyd, what we see, the Battersea Power Plant in London. 
they were really aggressive against uh, the authoritarianism and the greeds with this havon. And we have also to, to consider when we start to think how do we recover the conditions that many oil-derived products like plastics are in general derived from, from oil, but are the basis of the efficiency of a myriad of activities of humankind, like uh, hospital industry, construction, aeronautics, car industry, but with the but, but plastic is crucial to ensure weight reduction, therefore greater efficiency in terms of consumption. So to replace this reality, we cannot do it like this. It's impossible. It's going to take decades uh, to replace, and so it requires that we accept the possibility of gradual replacement progress process along with mitigation systems, including the CO2 direct uh, capture. And it's urgent to bolster fossil energy swift uh, replacement uh, rapidly by sun, wind and water technologies. But they still have colossal differences in terms of effectiveness that must be solved, as well as the impact on landscapes and natural ecosystems like what we are seeing is in Chile uh, with the lithium mines for the batteries technology. Dams and nuclear power plants are fairly common systems and debated, widely questioned for different reasons. In the case of dams, because of course the impact in nature and landscape, it's obvious. But only a few people know that the flooded areas release for a long time during decades um, a, big, um, a big quantity of methane, and methane is the, mo the most harmful greenhouse gas. On the other side, we have the nuclear power plants, that despite recent technologies improvements, like the idea of fusion instead of fission, still suffer from insurmountable vulnerability uh, in the moments of wars and riots. And we have uh, seen this in the war of Ukraine recently. And of course, uh, we, we all know that uh, nature don't have sinks for radioactive material. So, so this is still a lot uh, problematic. Another line of research and development are um, Possibilities like biofuels, tide, tide energy, water, water, wave power, geothermal systems, etc. But I would say that these images so shows one part of the of the challenge that is uh, really important to focus in. It's mixed systems that overcome the problem of breaks in wind and solar production. What are we going to do when we don't have sun or when we don't have wind? These are some po technical possibilities in order to provide energy during those breaks. Um, related with this and integrating the exhibition and book, Visionaries of uh, our edition, Terra, and curated by Anastasia Smirnova, uh, we had this work ex exhibited based on the multidisciplinary work of on coastal infrastructures by the collective ORG. It was a, a really uh, inspiring and uh, speculative visionary project about one artificial lens with multiple electricity production devices that utilize both tides, winds, waves, solar combined. And, uh, this is very important in countries like Portugal. Our country is really is, is small, and we are starting to have problems with the impact of solar farms. But we need to increase solar farms. But how to do it if we are a small country? But we are a small country, but big without the maritime area. And so this kind of technologies that ORG proposed on the Triennale are really important uh, solution. Another big challenge we're facing 
is the ecological footprint enlargement or multiplication by population growth. World's population has grown from 2.5 to 8.0 billion since 1950, and is expected to reach 10 billion, more or less, in 2055. But at the same time, when we uh, think about sustainability, how do we achieve sus sustainability, and what kind of sustainability are we speaking about? Of course, must be social and environmental sustainability. And practically no one thinks, when we read this, practically no one thinks that the Earth can handle these many people. But will the population continue to grow? I don't think so, and many people don't think so. These are two theoretical scenarios of population growth that were created by the mathematicians Thomas Malthus and Pierre Verhulst. The blue curve of exponential uh, growth created by Thomas Malthus was already denied by reality. It's not going to happen. The reddish curve on the right side that was calculated by Verhulst, it's the same vision of the authors of the limits to grow. So, conditions, natural and social conditions, are going to, to impose a stationary state. But these natural conditions can be scarcity, poverty, wars, and so on. And, um, of course, this stationary, uh, this stationary situation must happen because, as I said before, it's impossible to keep on growing, to, be, to keep on feeding a larger amount of population and so on, and to extract more materials from the earth. So a choice is laid down on mankind, on humankind. Will we wait for the extreme adverse conditions, or do we pro will we project a steady state in a, so a socially sustainable way? I prefer the second possibility. Therefore, demographic control is currently urgent in countries like India, that, has, that is, has a continuous accelerating population growth. India became the, the most populated country this year with 1.4 billion uh, inhabitants, three times the richest country, United States of America. So it's essential to direct educational policies to families, and women in particular in those countries, because empowering women, that is defended by several authors like David Attenborough, both through the acquisition of knowledge and the opportunities in society outside the domestic circle and having kids, with this, women will, women will aspire to another life model, for instance, professionally, and does limit the birth rate. Um, other strategic educational targets are lifestyle and consumerism. Hyper-consumerism of developed countries is impossible to, uh, to feed. Everything is discarded quickly, is no longer sustainable. We need much more frugality. And so, in terms of education, is also uh, a problem, the, wide, the widespread problem of eco-illiteracy has yet to be overcome. So it's neither broader information on the entire population and ecological culture subjects in the early school stages. I'm going to pose a few questions so that we understand the geometry of this problem. How do we solve the seemingly impossible equation of feeding growing population and assisting the poor while reforesting, which forces us to reduce agricultural areas, or while abandoning and reducing the use of impactful fertilizers that is going to decrease the production? And when about 40% of the agricultural lands are about to deplete due to countless harvests. And in a period of climate change and the context of scarcity of water, that is reducing 
the, the scale of the harvests. But there are solutions. One way with great potential in countless activities of humanity is the redu reduction of wastes and losses. We need more efficiency. Food production is a shocking example with where approximately uh, one third of the production is going to the garbage. So it's possible to fix the problem of uh, global food only by reducing waste. In the case of fertilizers, where currently only a tiny part is absorbed by the plants, it's necessary to, uh, to, uh, to force the application of micro uh, precision systems that substantially reduce losses and side effects. And of course, we need to find, we need to develop alternatives to the fertilizers. One alternative that is advocated by many people, it's the widespread use of genetic manipulated species. This is an example um, manipulated with by Norman, Norman Bor uh, Borlaug, this agronomist. It, it has a, an extraordinary success uh, achieving uh, in the combating anger in India and other countries. But still, despite the success with which this is a very controversial territory, it's highly debated, must be clarified because it's not clear that it's a uh, inoffensive sol solution. In the programs of the, of the Triennale, um, we had other possibilities considered, namely by Sebastien Marot on our fifth edition. Uh, in this exhibition, where he provided a holistic view on the historical gradual process of separation between agricultural lands and the cities. And in this exhibition and book, Sebastien Marot, I'm not going to explain these scenarios because Sebastien is going to be one of the lecturers and is going to be much more uh, clear uh, uh, ex uh, explaining. He established four possible scenarios of how to mesh territories that are urban and, are, uh, and agric agricultural with mutual benefit and reducing distances from production to consumption. In economics and its inherent values, it has, uh, economics is always in the core of, of, uh, of, the, of these problems. And, and so it's important to question some of its principles and values. If we learn from the past and from the, the Earth systems, it's clear that we have to replace the linear economy by a circular economy. But there is a, one very central problem in economic uh, theories today that is uh, social and environmental uh, negative side effects are considered externalities. externalities. They are not in the core, in the center of the politics and their costs are not included and these must be changed. How do I go back? It's, uh, I only, can you please put the image back to the graphics? Because with this, I don't know how to do it. Yes, this, perfect, thank you. Um, these are two graphics, the, the Kuznets curve and uh, of economics and the Kuznets curve of environment, but actually the curve of environment was created by those two uh, uh, economists. They are often evoked by economists, and they both suggest that it's needed an initial problem of increase of uh, inequality and pollution to achieve a turning point when this problem started to, start to be solved. But in reality, uh, the um, Kuznets curve uh, on the left was described by reality. And uh, the, the graphic on the right side of environmental uh, um, growth or um, sustainability 
was uh, denied because, in fact, the economists excluded important uh, pollution uh, forms and because they excluded the relocation of polluting activities from one country to another. So, of course, it's much more e easy to be uh, sustainable if we put the garbage on another country. Another obsession of economists and politicians is uh, GDP growth. They talk about this all the time. Without asking, like Simon Kuznets, the Russian economist who invented the concept, he, he, he had doubts if this would be the correct measure of society progress and well-being, and if it must be always growing. And when I, I, I listen, I follow these debates, I always remember the story of Charles Foster Kane that reveals that uh, how obsessive, uh, incessant pursuit of wealth can lead to isolation, can lead to degradation and downfall. And actually, despite the world economy being almost constantly growing, the current model uh, increased social differences to colossal levels. Now, 1% of the world population have more wealth than the rest of 99%. And 2 billion live on less than $3 a day. But fortunately, we have fantastic and inspiring books like these ones. These three books are widely referred by their relevance. Small is Beautiful from 1973 uh, was written by the economist Ernest Schumacher. He has a, an holistic and humanistic vision that questions a wide range of areas, from organization to technologies to property. And uh, he wrote in the chapter production this. One of the most fateful errors of our age is the belief that the problem of production has been solved. This was in 1973. This illusion is mainly due to our inability to recognize that the modern industrial system consumes the very basis on which has been erected. 50 years after, it's even more true. 15, year, 15 years after, it remains a highly relevant body of thought. Donut Economics by Kate Haworth proposes that economy must operate between two clear limits the inner limit of standards of human dignity and the outer limits, the limit of planetary limits. That refers to the nine limits that we've talked about before. She proposes regenerative and redistributive principles according to a systemic single, uh, uh, thinking. That, uh, she says, in opposition, to the, in opposition to the current model that is rigid. She proposes a state of harmonic balance. Uh, balance. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot the, the third book. In 2019, it was published uh, more from less. It's an optimistic vision from the MIT researcher Andrew McAfee. It's a technological-based view with the belief that the current market economy and the technological world is involving two lighter hardware with more functions in a single object. And so it's an evolution to a lighter and less impactful way of living. I, I would not be so optimistic. And when we read things like this, I would say that should be forbidden for companies and technologies with high carbon footprint to subsidize political parties and election campaigns. Otherwise, we, would, we will have this. The, so, as we say in Portugal, there are no free lunches. So, afterwards, of course, Donald Trump signed these contracts and uh, led the country into the Paris Agreement abandon, as we all know. And when we read information like this, of course, we think that uh, any subsidies and incentives to any kind of consumption of fossil fuels should be also abandoned. 
Today, the role of states and international organizations is strategic by managing regulatory fiscal and incentive frameworks. In this case, is the strategy of the United States of America in 2016 to divide support to the different ways of uh, producing energy. I would grow the the, um, the support to renewable energy and a bit to energy, uh, energy efficiency, and I would reduce fossil fuel support, of course. So, um, subsidies and incentives to cover the extra costs in the initial phase of the recent technologies is always, uh, uh, it's always needed. It's needed to support the boost uh, and boost the energy uh, of technological revolution. It's important to support open source processes like the digital revolution did. And it's, it's important to give solid support to universities and foundation researches and to promote circular economy. And since uh, states are large buyers, uh, I would say that sh they should take the initiative and set an example by buying, building, managing, doing everything they do, the states, with the principle of decarbonization. So, let's start with some facts. Humankind has built to date enough concrete to, concrete to cover the whole planet with a two millimeter, millimeter thick layer. China alone has produced, during the 21st century, more concrete than the United States did the entire 20th century. And in, by 2050, 70% of the population will be living in cities. So cities are strategic. New conceptions of urbanism must be inevitably considered. The expansion of cities must be planned inside the cities, not, not as sprawl. We must rehabilitate and reuse instead of new construction. And one, one thing that I, I think it's a, principle, a general principle, design relevant and lasting architecture because it raises the desire for its preservation. I think this should be obvious. And, of course, to take the extraordinary opportunity of this time to create new ways of doing architecture. In this field, it's important to question key technologies of construction, like, in this case, reinforced concrete with cement and steel, that together with aluminum, glass and plastic are the most impactful in terms of environment. In the case of reinforced concrete, made of two essential materials, the fabrication chemical reactions, re, uh, reactions generate colossal amounts of CO2. In the case of the cement, uh, the, um, the weight of CO2 produced is equivalent to the cement produced. In the case of steel, the weight of CO2 emitted is 1.8 the weight of, uh, of steel produced. So we need to find materials that are equivalent to cement, that are carbon neutral, not only because uh, compensation measures are included, like many labels of green cements we find in the market. We need to consider to consider hybrid materials. We need to consider hybrid structures like wood and metal on a bigger scale. We need to consider other hybrid, uh, hybrid approaches like, as an example in Lisbon, the project done by Carrillo da Graça to the cruise, um, to the, to the cruise um, terminal. Uh, in Lisbon was built with concrete incorporating cork. It's very uh, special and specific technology that uh, João Luís Carrilho da Graça um, prepared with a, a cement company in Portugal. Briefly, other uh, city dimensions to reflect. Uh, besides the obvious expansions of green and soil permeable areas. These, of course, are 
lines of development that we need to increase, that we all know, but mainly I would say the concept of the 15-minute city so that we can walk or travel through bike, etc. This kind of scenarios raise the needs of scrutiny of in the entire production chain impact. Like frontally pointed by the Charlotte Mar Malter Bart on our book Cycles. Certifications such as uh, LEED and BRIM try to do it, but they still need a lot of improvement. In the case of the certification LEED, it's in that it incomprehensively excludes rammed earth as something that is sustainable. So if we build something with rammed earth, we are not going to, uh, to get any, uh, any, any point uh, to have the, the certification in LEED. And uh, another example uh, that I'm going to give is that this was one of the main thematic fields of the exhibition book cycles uh, of our edition Terra. Uh, the room was a kind of a warehouse, the room of the exhibition, with the objects like if they were classified and waiting to be utilized. Actually, this exhibition was, um, the concept was based on Ilya Kabakov's text the man who never threw anything away. It's obvious. And the reference was to refuse to label anything as garbage or waste. So this exhibition proposed um, uh, basically the systematic reuse of buildings and their components. The combat to combat the trivialization of extractivist culture and to research in the field of ancestral materials such as touched cork, wood, rammed earth, etc., and the value of the circular economy. One example of the projects and offices represented in this exhibition were the studio Recreate. Actually, their practice is based on the idea that a building that is about to be demolished is a, a source, can be a source of elements that, that, that are disassembled that are stored, that are classified to be reused. This is what they do. And another completely different example on this uh, same exhibition was this project done by the Royal Danish Academy that in fact uh, got the Triennalis Prize uh, by their, uh, for their work. Actually, they developed systemat through systematic technical testing the, re the fire resistance of touched systems through the introduction of a layer of clay. And um, finally, I'm going to close with a, a fantastic, marvelous book, Portuguese book, maybe the best book on Portuguese architecture of the 20th century. This book, ac actually, it's an inquiry that was carried out during the 50s in Portugal, from north to south, teams of architects coordinated by the well-known architects, did a survey of uh, typologies, materials from the granite blocks to the rammed earth in the south, relating with the climate, with social activities, all the different aspects that uh, construction must deal with. It's a, a fantastic book that exerted for decades a uh, really important impact on generations of architects. This book has a, um, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic um, group, uh, well, I would say an immense quantity of information that is important to revisit, to cross with the most advanced cur current technologies for, I would say, a sustainable future. I'm going to show you some more images of the of this book is Kerik Asko
Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It was, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. It's a beautiful place. And yeah, makes me a little bit nervous to be here. And also <laughs> for the fantastic lecture before. So uh, what we can do about that, what we can do as architect uh, to, uh, to give answers. And probably my lecture is a little bit about that. I try to give you some answers um, and I will start, yeah, starting point with one project which was very important for our office nearly 20 years ago. Then uh, it's the Haus Rauch. And then I will uh, give you uh, a focus on that, what I do with my students and what we develop with my students. And then I will come back to my own work uh, and some way uh, uh, out of the ideas which I develop together with my students. So in my case, it's often my work and what I do at the school is always related. And so you, you will see uh, uh, what it means uh, in my work that I do both. I teach and I also have my own office. And yeah, today it will be about the zero point uh, <laughs> material. Earth, <laughs> because this is an earth house, and uh, yes, on, if you come with leads, you, you don't get any points. Um, it's made, yeah, we, we start this house together. It's the house from Martin Rauch, it's in Austria. We start to plan that nearly 20 years ago. I was you know, a younger architect, and and, uh, and Martin was already a well-known earth builder, and he wants to do his own house with me. And uh, for him, it was very important um, yeah, to show everything what he could do in earth on that point, after 10, 15 year, years' experience with earth. And in my case, he was interested in me because before I did an earth house in Zurich, and he couldn't, couldn't believe that the, the city really builds these small houses, so he, invi he invited me to do, together with him, his own house. So it should be kind of uh, example what you can do in earth, uh, yeah, already now, 50, 20 years ago. So he already did bigger steps, and I also did bigger steps, but it was for us a very important starting point. So it's a three-story high building, completely made in earth. And uh, it's the site, uh, it's in Austria, it's the, the hill is the hill from his family. And of course, I did a master plan with a lot of earth houses, but at the very end, uh, I, I look if you have a point there, I did many houses around here, but at the end, only this house happened because his brothers and sisters doesn't want to do an earth house. But, uh, but uh, yes, uh, there are all the houses, it's, now there. So the, the, the special thing is really the excavation there is really the house, one to one, the same material. We have new, no other material which we bring to the site, three story. The, the slabs are in wood, like really uh, normal, beam, nearly trees out of the forest next to it. It was very important to be to use material which are very close and very near to the site. So the beams for the slabs are really from the forest, uh, from the next. I hear the chili dot works in the same way here. Yeah? So, and you see the shape of the beams, they are real beams, <laughs> real trees. So this is the, the result, the three-story high building. Uh, and you see these layers which protect the earth walls. These small layers are kind of nose which uh, the water can drop. So it's a kind of protection of the, of the skin. And you see how it, we did that. You see the excavation. You, we take this material out, we, we split it, and then we remix it, and we bring it into the framework. The framework is very close to, or is a kind of, is a concrete framework, which we use today. It's a heavy framework, because if you ram, you have a lot of pressure on the framework, so it has to be very strong. So it's a stronger, if you do the same as in concrete, the framework will be smaller. So you see this is, the architects will see that it's a very strong framework. So uh, we come now also to some, some more information about uh, why it's interesting probably to build in earth. First of all, uh, the humus, the first 30, 50 centimeters, this material we always can use. 
This we take away, then we put it again in, and we put some trees on it. This is a material we don't bring away normally. But if you come a little bit more down, uh, deeper, then you come often into flatland, and also in Spain and in France and Switzerland, Germany, you come to this part, which is, which is the part of the excavation which you can't use. And often this is with low minute or with with, uh, with the perfect mixture of earth which you can use to build. And what we do normally, this is my assist, Feli Hilkers, make this calculation, maybe only the, the middle part is very important. This is Zurich. And here you see the amount of building material which we bring into Zurich. And here you see the amount of excavation of earth which we bring out of Zurich. And the only thing you have to recognize that the, that this, the measurement of this uh, fingers uh, have, have nearly the same height. It means, it means we bring as exactly the same amount of building material into the city as we bring earth material out. And uh, the reason is, the idea is simple. If you can connect that, so we don't throw everything away in that sense, uh, we can save a lot of energy, of course. And this is the idea to, to go on with uh, earth and to make that useful. And uh, and we hear the, uh, um, <coughs> the if you if you think about the CO2 emission from concrete, uh, this is the same. Nearly, it's it's even worse than the amount of the airplane industry from the CO2 uh, aspect. And if we can use earth instead of concrete, we can save extremely a lot of energy. So this could be one way of saving energy. And even this. Uh, is a uh, very important chamber. And often, you hear that also, <laughs> garbage, Switzerland brings often her earth back. It, has, it, it, doesn't keep, they, it doesn't keep the earth. They bring it to Germany. So they even take many energy, needs a lot of energy to bring it away. So this is also an aspect we should have in mind. If you look to this map, the, the question is where you have earth to build. So in all the dark spots, you, can, you find the material to build, it's Spain, it's Morocco, it's France, it's Switzerland, everywhere you find uh, these darker plots which you find material to build with. So there's no reason worldwide to, to don't use this material. Um, here the section, you see the structure goes up, three story high, you see the, sea, the, the beams, the, the layers we put in to protect the earth. We also did some uh, hybrid construction together with the bricks. The bricks are also hand burnt uh, loam brick with not that much energy. We always t take care to don't use that much energy. Here is the excavation material and here has the building. This is the same material. And we, out of that, we make, we, Martin didn't want to close that gap anymore. So at the beginning we thought, oh, this is not so, <laughs> this we, di we didn't have in design, but then we had the idea to, just to show it and to make a quality out of that, uh, to, the, to show uh, the, the beginning of the material and then the geometrical form of the material. This is the, are the floor plan. You come directly in, you have, uh, we, just, we didn't insulate everything. The staircase is an in-between climber. So you go in, it's not insulated, but earth has a better, uh, has better, uh, is better in the case of keeping the heat. It's not that good that if, like you insulate it, it's about 0 0.6 if you talk about uh, the, U, uh, the U shape. Um, but we tried here to go on, and then we, we went on to the staircase, and then we went into the first level with, with the living part and the atelier part. And inside, we, we put some straw on the wall, and we plaster it again with earth, and we have a rammed earth floor, so we have still the earth inside. But we have to do so another layer to, to come to the 0 0.25, uh, which you need to to get the permit. The funny thing is, uh, when we built that, Martin was hoping that he get some money because he did the very best he could do uh, in, the, in the ecological sense, for the material size, but also from the energy size. But he didn't get, at the beginning, any money because they couldn't calculate what he really did or what we really did. So there was no numbers. So it means <laughs> nobody, the, I couldn't show really documents that it's better than to build with concrete. So 
And it takes a long time that he, at the end he gets some money, but it was not clear um, that it will work. And at the beginning was a little bit a challenge to really to start because we don't have this supporting money. So then you come up, uh, we have two rooms, the bigger atelier, the sleeping room for Martin, the not insulated part and the insulated part. And yes, and then we start to do some research. Martin calculated every shovel, every a step he did, and he calculated that he is, uh, if you build the house around normal in a conventional way, you can save around 50% of energy. Doing that way, we expect even more, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and, but he, we calculate 50%, and we also have found some other aspect with the University of Lucerne that the humidity is always around 50%, which is for you being, being a very well comfort zone. If you do normal, you have a much bigger spread. So you have also this effect that do you feel comfortable in this material, and this is also a positive thing. To regulate the humidity means also you can save, if you have an air system, normally they put water in to regulate that. If you, don't, if you have earth, you don't have to do that or not that much. You can save energy. It's also about CO2 and energy costs. Why is it important to talk about construction energy? Because we can say, we also can say positive things. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did a good job in, 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 in the part of operation energy. We insulate more and more our building. We, the, the building systems are getting better and better. We are more efficient. And of course, we come a little bit closer. Cities are not that bad because we are closer. 50 minutes with bicycle is a, is a good thing, but it needs density. But the construction energy gets more and more important. And so it means that we have, should have a stronger focus on construction energy. So how we build or do we build, uh, first of all, do we really build? Uh, still, or when we build, how we build. So, out of that, uh, we did this uh, house and we have a big success. We won many prizes and so, great. <laughs> but there was some questions also, because we want to do something good, we want to do something relevant, we want to show this is possible, but one thing was really do that material has something to do with our culture? Is it really something which we have a culture with? Does it make sense to build an earth in Europe? So yes, uh, I show we have earth, but do we have a culture? This was one question. The second question was, it's a nice little house, but you can't scale up that. You know, this is no, you know, this is no, it's not a strong, thing because it's only good for small building and this is not the answer in the city, what he was talking about. So, yeah, we felt a little bit, uh, we have to do something about that. And then uh, I was invited uh, in several schools and uh, 2017 in the EPFL in Lausanne, which we start our research and we publish this book and we talk about tradition and we talk about potential in earth architecture. And we did this uh, mock-up here, and I will come to that, what we did. Uh, first of all, we did a research, and we want to look where we found uh, earth building, and we focus only about rammed earth building. There are several systems. You can build it adobe, we can uh, build in wood, and you put some earth in between. So there are many systems, but we, we focus on earth, rammed earth construction. Rammed earth is interesting because the highest building in earth, uh, in rammed earth, is made in rammed earth construction. So it's really a, a construction principle which you allows you to build a little bit higher than probably other techniques. So what we found, uh, and we already know, but we, we went back in the region of Lyon. There's a lot. There are a lot of earth buildings. And we found it extremely interesting to go back there to study uh, what these uh, old buildings are. We found also some building we don't know in Geneva, as in Switzerland, next to, to Lyon. It's clear in this region the, the knowledge just spread. But we also found uh, here in where we are in Zurich, but uh, mostly here in the east part of Switzerland, in St. Galm, some other 300 years old rammed earth buildings, plastered, nobody knows it, they're nearly forgotten. All, a lot of these buildings are forgotten. 
And so, uh, and why it was, because it was interesting, to, the story was why the building came to this point, because this was a strong textile trade here, so traditionally three, four hundred years ago. And this part in Switzerland produced textile, they went down here and they sell the textile and they take the building technique back to, to Switzerland. So this is the reason why we have this technique also in Switzerland. And the interesting point, it's clear this Ramadur construction came from Morocco over Spain to, to, to France, to Lyon, to Switzerland, and then back to Italy. And so we have this ring, it would be interesting to close at the end. We already went to, the, uh, to Morocco to make some new uh, images, new drawings. We did that. <laughs> uh, we went to, uh, to Lyon, we, we went to the countryside and found this beautiful former building, 200 years old. We make the drawings also and just make a card out of that to, to have a book to show the people there are buildings. This was a funny building in Geneva. This is also a little farm building. The owner of this uh, building told us this is an old concrete building. And we told him, oh, no, 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 this is a Fisse building. You know, you see this, this whole stair. This is exactly the, the old framework. No, no, <laughs> this is concrete. We sent him a book. We hope he believe it now. But uh, <laughs> this is about earth. Because we built the old frameworks with our students. We did a big exhibition in Lausanne. The, the book is, in a way, a catalog of our exhibition we did in, in, uh, in Lausanne, and here you see why we know it's because of these beams, you know. That's a beautiful construction. This is only five years old, this picture. This is how you should work uh, with earth normally in, if you build in Europe, uh, even if you have a lot of rain, probably also here in uh, <laughs> San Sebastian. Uh, a big roof to protect the construction, a good base, probably strong corners and some details sometimes with windows and this is a very perfect construction, survived 200 years in Europe, in the middle of Europe, no problem. I did, I did it a little bit more abstract with these little layers, so, um, but this is the traditional way of building in our region because Lyon is really close to Geneva, but the funny thing is uh, Lyon was a kind of resistant uh, place. Uh, so in the French Revolution, they fight against the king, so they burn everything down. And this was also the reason why they start to rebuild, to reuse earth again, because they have nearly nothing after this revolution. And they did nearly everything in earth, not only the farmer's house, also the churches, a nice example. And it is, they did that. And uh, the funny thing, this is one of the huge structures we found. It's even bigger than the Ricola building. We was there uh, two weeks ago again. Again, a funny story. Uh, we have some guides who show us that. And we knock on the door, and the owner is one of the most beautiful old buildings. They didn't let us in because they didn't understand why we was interested in this building. <laughs> this is also the story about Earth. Still, you know, we published that now. <laughs> it's even more and more. Uh, <laughs> The people uh, go there and visit, but they still don't come in. Was, uh, <laughs> they still don't believe it's relevant. <laughs> and in Switzerland, uh, this is textile fabric, which is 300 years old. In Switzerland, it's clear they, they did this part in earth, but they plaster it. You don't see it anymore. It did survive perfectly, proper, like Swiss are. Uh, but it's also a way of dealing with earth. It doesn't mean that you have to show it all the time. So this is... Uh, and this is uh, wood and, and earth, but everything is plastered in the perfect shape. So this is the part of tradition. Do we have a tradition? Yes, we have, you also have. And I think it's, it makes sense to go back, to look what we did in our tradition, and to ask us ourselves how we can go on with our tradition in earth to come probably to another scale. And this is the second point. We, we start to think about oh, how we can scale up this technique. And we start with our students to build mock-ups. And we came to hybrid structure, because hybrid is probably a smart way also to use earth to scale up earth construction. And this is a hybrid structure, concrete and earth. It's not that we say concrete is bad, but just use 
concrete like gold because it has a lot of energy in it. And if you use it, you, you exactly know why you use it. And you probably use not very much, but there where you need maybe the fundament or something. Uh, but take it, use it careful. And what we did with, with an artist, Philip Scher is a friend of mine, ask him, we want to do some hybrid structure, can you help us, can you inspire us? And he did these images of systems of earth, wood, steel, and concrete, and the, build, and the student built it one to one. But he also did that, so this is maybe chili dot <laughs> in earth. <laughs> uh, other, you also see that we learn from, from sorry, we go back, we learn from uh, yeah, from, from Lyon, with these corner details, which are extremely beautiful to, to stabilize the corner. And he's already a well-known artist. He's in the Pompidou, and so he, he do this, uh, this, this work. Uh, but at that time, he helps us, so today he does, doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> but it was really inspiring to have him as an artist uh, helping us to inspire, to find other way, other languages of using earth. And this is also a very important Point. I also believe that this is a chance to, to rethink our, uh, the way how we do architecture. It's an extremely we heard so many problems, but on the other hand, it's so interesting to come out of this problem. And this is probably one way. And the students, they were pretty clever. They normally, if you do earth construction, you just can do an arch in the, in the force line. This is what you can do. This is not possible. But once students combine wood and earth and put it under pressure, and say, I can do a, a normal slab in earth. He stands on it and says, this is work. And Martin Rauch, a new concept, very famous earth builder, and there was in the studio, said, yes, it could be. And maybe you know the Hortus system, which Herzog Tümero built now. It's based on that idea with this curve, not on the pressure uh, construction, but in general, it's the same system to have the the mass of earth in the ceiling to regulate also the, the climate in the house. So it was pretty inspiring what the students did there. But we take this system, we turn it to this way, and we did that. We put the whole construction on the pressure. We have three beams, they are in concrete. Then we put it on the pressure. And why we did that? Because we found out if we can do that, we can scale up uh, construction as a hybrid system on the tension to 25 or 40 meters. So we can come into the city and attack the second point, which they told me this is not relevant because it's small. The technique doesn't allow to, to build higher. So we have to do that, but to, to, to show that it's probably possible. But uh, one problem was earth, if you ram, it's very wet. It takes four to eight weeks until you can bring the load on it but it's still shrinking. So if you put that on the pressure uh, and the system shrinks, there's no pressure anymore. So there was a big question if this really works. We have to, so we have to work, we have to build it. And we did it, of course, we have no money, we did it with our students, <laughs> uh, but they like it. And there was many students from all over the world uh, which uh, was in this workshop. We worked six weeks. And this is a textile factory and all. Today is an art factory. Sitte work is a very important art factory. We, gave, we, gave, we also go to them and tell them, you have an earth tradition. Can we do an earth mock-up in your place? And, oh, we didn't know that, but, but um, they understood and they let us do. Uh, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, and uh, we can build there our mock-up. And this was the result. And you see the steel cable in between which pulled the whole construction on the pressure. It was this system, which we turned that. And then we start to measure. And what happened was that this is the machine to, to put the structure on the pressure. This is the detail. And this was the measurement. And it works after six months. <laughs> we were stable. And we can say well, it is also the, the question was also the earthquake case. If you have an earthquake in earth construction, this is also stable, stabilized these problems. But six months is a little bit long because in concrete, you take three, three days for that, <laughs> for the same system. So we say, OK, we were successful, but probably we have to change something. Uh, probably we have to go on. Um, but it was interesting. And we 
still measure there, and the, the mock-up is still there because the artist factory likes the mock-up still. So if you are in St. Gallen, you can visit that. So I went to the TU Munich. Afterwards, I went to the ETH in Zurich, and we had uh, a little museum which came to us and asked us for an earth building. It was the Brickwork Museum in Kalm. It's next to Zurich. And because I was in, uh, in Munich, I thought, let's go on with air construction in Munich. And the uh, students from Munich develop uh, for this little museum, which is an old brickwork factory, 130, 150 years old, which today works as a museum. They like to show here is an earth pit. And this was an old earth pit. Today it's water and it's biotope. It's, everything is under protection here. But they like to, they only don't they don't want to talk about bricks because bricks has a lot of energy. They also want to talk about loam or earth because they also have it on the side. For them, was it interesting to not only look backwards, probably also to look forwards because they have many class and schools which come to this place and visit, and they want to also talk about the future. So they ask us to do a little tower. This is the old brickwork factory built with reuse material. 130 years ago, so they already use reuse because uh, yeah, they, this guy has not much money. So it's interesting to fit four, 500 years old building these beams in this building, and the students start to develop, of course, bigger structure because we want to attack this question of scale again because they want to have a tower to have an overview of the whole site to explain the people where the air pits are, where that and that the landscape. So all the students try to do higher buildings, of course, often on the tension. And some of them develop other things, nice exhibition spaces, but also uh, often, because in the old brick factory, you can't burn anymore the stone because it's wood, and the fire police doesn't allow that anymore, so they couldn't show what they did 120 years. So, some students had the idea to integrate an oven again, that they can show also how you burn uh, loam. And the Rinner project was a little bit that. Uh, but at the end, this project was a combination of three projects with the oven, with an exhibition space, with the platform. It was not the hugest one, but it was nine meter high. And you see, again, a tension construction with the wood beam, not concrete anymore and with some springs on the top to have the load always on the same. So with a new idea to, to come to this three-day uh, answer. <laughs> and we have another problem. The site was completely under protection. They asked us to do a building, but they forgot that they couldn't build there anything because everything was under protection. So uh, we did that, and then we started to start talk with the government, and then there was a big discussion. And at the end, they want to support the museum. They say, okay, you can build, but only for 10 years. Then you have to bring the thing away. So we have to say, okay, we have to do a heavy building, but it has to be circular, or oh, this is another aspect. So we produce all these blocks in elements. You see the APFL research we did. We put it on the tension, and the idea was even the fundament that you can take everything out again, and we bring, can bring it to... Chili Dub Museum, or <laughs> in ten, 10 years, whatever you want. But it, was a, but it was also interesting to think about something heavy which, uh, uh, in a circular way, because circular doesn't mean always to use old material. Circular also means to, the, the construction today should be like that, that you can reuse your building. So you can use new materials, but the thing is, Think about that you can reuse it because the most of the buildings are done that you don't, you can't reuse because you don't think to how you bring the, the things into uh, disappear. So this is also an aspect, and you can combine, of course, with all the new material. So circular means not only old; it could be also with new material. So what we did also, and we was very proud about. We produced this earth element in an old cement factory, which was closed. So we was, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we go there and produce with, at the end, was more than 100 students involved in this project. Uh, around three schools from, which we always first uh, 
Theo Munich, then from uh, ETH support, because the event then to the ETH, we have support for students. And then we invite so many students to produce these blocks. And we did more than 100 blocks, and we let them dry in the factory, in the old cement factory, because we want to reduce the shrinking to come to these three days, uh, which the concrete can do. So we uh, prefabricate everything. Again, the students on, on the site, they, was, they have absolutely pleasure. Nobody was, <laughs> they don't get money, but they get something to sleep and to drink, so this was enough. And yeah, and then we start to build this building in elements with the structure behind. You see the section with the oven, with the platform to see to have the view, with the little exhibition space, with the door which plays a little bit with this tension idea. And yeah, the old factory and the new uh, building, the entry situation, it's kind of big, it's a big mock-up. It's a research building. It's a very simple thing, but it reminds me a little bit about this artist work from Philip Scherer uh, with this thing, a very, very simple shape. And then in the middle, we show every element. We didn't want to show that how, uh, we want to show every joint we did. In the middle, we have some Murano glass from Italy, handmade glass. So uh, this company supports us and gives us this glass. We have many supporters for this project also. And in the middle, we have the tension construction, which goes on two sides in that case. And of course, it, it comes to a new um, answer, in, also in earth construction, because we have a, you have a very light construction and you have a very heavy one, and together is a kind of vibration, and maybe it's even stronger, it's even heavier and even lighter, and this dialogue we like a lot. And in some details we could create, because we have this uh, problem of uh, three days, and, and from the beginning, uh, to be safe for the earthquake case. Here you see the little springs we in involved, and we, we see the whole system and often. And yeah, it was not an insulated building, so this was a little bit easier because it could be just a normal space without uh, any insulation for the museum. And this is the backside and with the oven, and you see the details we take from Lyon. You see the, the, the pressure details with the cable. You see the ex extremely simple floor plan, and often there we have uh, we use um, uh, earth blocks, and then the exhibition space, and we use the, the cable to pr to to fix the shelters that we have always used the element in a double sense, and the stair was also just one minor element which we can put out, and the big frame, the pressure frame is in wood in that way, and the fundaments are concrete with the uh, nails for the structure, but we can put that out because there are elements. And this was the result. The Brickwork Museum could show the exhibit what they have, these old uh, bricks, and we have a beautiful combination of tension construction. And now we have to measure, we're still measuring. And this, the red line, the red line is the, is the old mock-up from Sitterberg, which comes slowly, slowly down and then stay, and this, this blue one is the new one, which uh, is a little bit shaking, but in general goes in one direction. It means it works from the beginning. So for us, yes, we did <laughs> that now. And it's probably an answer to, uh, to a bigger scale to, and to scale up a traditional technique. So, and it has its own beauty because the details we don't know. I think it's the first building worldwide with, with attention construction. It's in a way another answer. And then to start to play with that a little bit, to have a door which is also a tension construction, to start then to design with this aspect. Of course, I sketch a lot with my students and I also Im was involved in some details. But in general, I didn't draw any uh, particular drawings. It was all by, made by students. So this is the result. And yes, then I come back so I, I give these two answers now. <laughs> After 10, 50 years, I have it. And uh, I think uh, we are able to, to come to a bigger scale. So this influenced, of course, a lot what we did in our office. And I come to this project. It was also kind of case study project. The steel industry was asking what we can do for the future, because we know we use a lot of CO2. What we can do uh, in the future, and we say the answer is simple. You have to do uh, 
maybe you come to this picture, you have to do smart hybrid construction. Steel is okay, we, we use steel cable too, but maybe you need another material, steel, you should use steel there, it's really necessary, but probably in the other, if you're for walls, it could be something different, in our case, of course, earth. So we found it interesting to combine steel and earth, and not only say uh, we use steel, uh, on, let's go to the factory, we use old, of course, old steel element that we reuse the steel. This was also something we say, of course, if you use steel, it's reused. Uh, and the beams are reused. And do you see these elements? This, uh, these are normally, I will show that, normally use them to, for excavation. We put them on the earth, we take the earth out, they take the steel element out, and this, with these elements we produce uh, slabs. So kind of combination. And now it's a heavy, a heavy slide, I know. Oops, <laughs> maybe I go back, yes. You see the inside structure completely in earth. It's an earth construction on the pressure. It's 25 meter high, it's in the city, next to Zurich in Rapsi, it's close to the student home. And it was not a scale. We, we just take the, with the same engineer, your concept, which would support us for also for the last uh, smaller building. We did that and, uh, and then we put the structure on the tension and it works, and the result was that uh, a student home with some working space, uh, a floor which are, is more public, the structure again, which is on the tension with the reused steel uh, slabs, with the hanging system to don't have too many connections to the inside to save energy at the end, so we use it in a double sense, hanging and tension. Again, this play with these two aspects, and this we do with our students. Uh, reuse steel as a slab system, which we at the end will fill up with earth and the earth wall, which is on the tension. And the results, we start to build also earth models uh, because it's also very thin, but it works and they are beautiful. And we start to do another step. We start to use earth also for the building, uh, for the, for the uh, um, the building systems. So we produce on the roof uh, electricity, but also hot water. And we took the hot water to the tanks, which we have in these vertical elements, which we have the staircase, and we have different temperature zone, and we put that back to the earth wall. We have a heating system in the wall, and because earth is very good in protecting energy, uh, we have a kind of heating system integrating in earth wall. So we start to combine uh, so, uh, aspect of technical aspect with structural aspect and make one design piece out of that. The result was that we could save 60% of, um, of uh, energy which you use for the heating system and there is also a benefit and of course the structures anyway 50 or, or more percent better than a normal structure. So try to combine everything and make a smart um, thing, smart project out of that. This is the, the technical drawing about this system. And then you see uh, these are only rendering. Uh, and this is the platform. And here is the view to Zurich, and there is the lake. So, uh, And uh, we won this competition. Uh, it was a kind of case study. And the, the plot is uh, the Swiss railway company is the owner of the plot. And they say, OK, we, let's do it. They, they tell us that this was five years ago. So uh, until now, they say, yes, we will do it, but next year. <laughs> next year, next year. Uh, probably <laughs> it's a little bit innovative, this project. But they didn't, they didn't say no. They, they, they still wait to go on. But these projects are directly related to our research. Another project we just won last year is the Judy's Museum in Hamburg, uh, next to the Hamburg, uh, Hamburger Bahnhof, Hannoversche Bahnhof. Uh, there was uh, yeah, it's a site which today is came as a, or the Günther Vogt did this site. Beautiful, it's just next to the Elb Philharmonie from Herzog Dömerow. And it's a site which they deport 8,000 people, Jewish people and, and others, uh, and most of them died and, and they they did uh, a park out this, of this, because there was the, the old station, now it's on the other side. 
And yes, they want to have a museum at the very end after creating the landscape in a way new. They and talk about where the people was taking away. They, they also want to have a museum and this little museum we won. Uh, this is this house here. And it's, of course, a little small earth block, and which uh, is on the tension. And it's a, dob a very simple museum in double, uh, double uh, rooms. We have no, it's just not big fundament, no rooms under the earth, because anyway, it's difficult because of the water, which is coming up and down. So for two spaces, we integrate the whole technique in the building. And we have just two levels, which are very flexible uh, with the hybrid um, uh, ceiling system and with the idea you have a monolithic earth construction. So until now we are on track. <laughs> uh, we, they want to build it. The city is really happy to have, uh, to have this building. But to be honest, we're not sure if we come out with the, with the proper earth mix. Maybe it can be a stabilized earth construction, which is also a tradition. But still, we want to use a lot of earth, and because uh, the museum is that important also for the people, it's so emotional, it should be honest in a way. And yeah, this was the reason why we were successful, but on the other hand, uh, it's also, yeah, it's, uh, it's something which, of course, is related to uh, that, what we did with our students in the school. The, the inside is really close to the our house Rauch with, the, with lo loam plaster everywhere. Then there's some floor plans, some flexible rooms in the basement, and then you go up, and then you have the exhibition room, uh, which is very simple and just open. And you have the view back to the old station that you are related to that place with, where everything happened, and the rest is flexible, and inside also with uh, loam plaster. This is the view to the bridge. With the same system, you see the elements. Uh, also, you see the gaps, which there will be steel cable in it. Yes, so we hope we can build that. Yeah, we come now uh, some some other project. I just came here to a point with the with with the earth construction, but at the end we talk about also hybrid structure. It's not. Uh, Every building is, or every client is ready to, to build in earth because we hear that the Swiss rail company is a little bit afraid. So we also have to do find other way of uh, reuse material or do combinations of uh, hybrid system. And, and this is something, a client which was a little bit afraid and we still try to find answer. This is a reuse brick facade. Uh, completely real, 100 years old brick, which are beautiful if they can use them. It's a, just a small housing. Uh, we, we didn't pull down the neighbor house. We found it uh, great to have, even if the seafront is there. Uh, and then we, we did some seven flats. It's a small house, and you see just uh, outside. It's also together with concrete, because the, the client was a lawyer, and he was pretty afraid to build with this material because it's one of the most ex in, uh, expensive area in Zurich with the sea view. It's probably, we all, um, like our sea view, is extremely expensive. And he was extremely afraid he can't rent out the flat um, because we used this material. So we didn't ram the, the, the walls. It, it's our, they are small earth blocks which are also pressed, but uh, simpler made. And it's a hybrid structure which we came to the point that the client started, okay, let's do it. Uh, we do reuse stone, reuse blocks, and it's a little bit uh, with earth uh, plaster. This is the mat material we use for the walls. We again use the excavation of the, one of the most e expensive places in, in Switzerland uh, and to do these blocks. And this is the material. And these are the guys, the TerraBlock is a young company from Geneva young guys who produce these earth blocks. We work together with them. They produce it with this small machine, and we put it in. And this is maybe, I want to show that because it's maybe a quieter and a simpler way of using earth. It's also cheaper to do it in this way. Everybody can do it. It's not, you don't need such a big knowledge. And it was a normal uh, construction company who did that. And so we was able to bring it to the market in a way, to be close there, not 
only in a school frame or completely special use like a museum. This was one try uh, to do that together, a double skin facade, reuse block, reu reuse earth material. And then again, the question of scale up. Uh, we did a little hotel, it's just finished, it's a new project with the same system. Again, a client is a public client, the hotel is uh, the city St. Gallen, again, the, 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 the place which has earth building. We told them they have earth building, and we did this small slab. Uh, we couldn't, this is this part, this is the area of the station again, it's a beautiful museum down there, with a restaurant, which is an old uh, building which they have to train in earlier. And this plot here with the old, we didn't pull down the old villa. In between, we did something small and high, and we want to do it, of course, with earth. The client didn't want to use reuse bricks. We didn't bring that through. So uh, I have to say, we found some beautiful blocks uh, we, uh, with, uh, with Peterson. This is the same blocks which Zumto use. So this, they agree, they are also handmade, but they are new. Just the plot, a very simple structure with an existing building. We didn't pull down anything. We want to keep this, even if it wasn't very narrow. On the other hand, you could do this very small shape, which is, of course, beautiful. Uh, and the house, and we tried to find a dialogue with color and, 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 and details, and also with the color of the bricks. And we used some old terracotta technique to, to make the windows, and then a very rigid and a very simple uh, floor plan, the entry situation. And then you see inside the same system. It's a, it's, a, it's a structure in concrete. We just did what we have to do. And then we fill it up with earth blocks. And uh, this was a, I have to hurry a little bit, section. And this is what we did. So we produce even bigger earth blocks. These are also rammed earth blocks at the end, on the, but industrial made. It was, the, for the young company, was a completely out of scale. He, they have to collaborate with other companies which, which normally produce cement, um, cement plates, and they do put the machine like that, that they could produce rammed earth stone. It was pretty heavy. The, the builder on the side was really angry with us because it was so heavy to put them on the side, but so we have many question and one question was also the noise on both, both sides which we don't have numbers for that because in a hotel it's very important that it's not that loud so can we do that with this material so we take a lot of risk to do that and the, the young company nearly come to um, to to that they nearly come down because they produced the first time with another company from the cement, but they don't have every stone under control, and we don't have the perfect quality, so they, the client didn't accept many of these stones because of the shape. So they have to rebring uh, stones which are in better shape. It means uh, it was a really challenge only to do that, and the result was that. There was a discussion because it was not so perfect to plaster on, on that, but uh, at the end we couldn't, with many helpers, we, get, we, get, we went one week, we go with our, 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 our friends to, sh to fix the wall, to make it beautiful, that the client accept the wall, just to, to talk how it really <laughs> is, and then it, the result is now that, so you can go there now and sleep in earth, you have the regulation, and you have this uh, from the material, and it's a hybrid uh, system at the end, of course, but it's, a, it's 35 meters high. It doesn't mean that it's carrying this 30, but we, the, the, the scale is a, is a different one, which we use in a hybrid way, earth, and also earth plaster, the entry hole here with earth blocks. And yes, so for us it was an excess success, because we really, the city builds it, and it's a, a little skyscraper, it's in the city and it's another scale. And even if it's not everything in earth, it's something, you know. So even after 20 years doing the house Rauch, it's a big challenge to be really radical. This is the reality also with the, and this is maybe also important to know, but uh, 20 years ago I was also happy to just have earth plaster on the walls. This was also a success at that time. Right now, this is also a success. But we did the house Rauch, which was very, uh, of course, very, uh, very uh, radical, 
But yeah. And then we have another client. This is a monastery which we just finished. This client, uh, uh, it's a beautiful monastery from the 70s. This building in the middle, it's a competition we won. And it's a new building for the monastery, the, mostly to sleep and to eat. So they extend that. And sorry, it's the wrong way. And we did that. Again, a hybrid structure, uh, ramet, 25 meters high. Again, we concrete. We had the idea to, to make a grid, to make fillings with wood or with earth. The client was plus minus excited about that. And uh, what we did to come to this 25 meters high earth wall, uh, we, we put some chalk in. We stabilized the earth construction with chalk, kind of truss mixed. Of course, the CO2 balance is less good, but it's still ramming. And we still are able to come to a, because we want to have this wall <laughs> to show our clients we can go in this dimension, even if we stabilize that. French often, you know, America, Australia, often you have stabilized construction. We can discuss that if this is good or bad. But still, uh, often there is 90 to 95% earth in it. Then you have some chalk or cement, but it's still better than concrete. So it's also a hybrid way in the mixed. And this wood infills, which, which was at the end not always wood, because they didn't want to pay the whole wood construction. So we have a kind of hybrid and wood and, and plaster material. And you see some, this is very new. It's just not finished, this rammed earth wall. And then we went into, this is again a rendering, the inside space. It's, uh, we have a little church, and we have the entry situation, which we bring this material in to the space, uh, also a ramet space with this window, renderings, floor plans, and this is the result. This is one. This is real now. Also the ramet construction into the wall with, uh, of course, a Murano glass facade, handmade. I, I told you before, um, my grand grandma is from Mestre. Probably this is the way I like handmade glass. I always use. I like to use material which are really has which you feel the craftsman. And this is the result, and of course, together with, with and then the wood in fields with the beautiful view and the terrace to the seaside. And yeah, for us was that uh, again a success, even when we can do the proper mixture of earth. And we don't have to stabilize, with chalk is strong enough, we don't have to stabilize. This is, in a way, another system. So with that, I come to the last project, it's a hybrid wood construction, and it's the biggest project we have now in the office. Uh, it's the sports center next to Zurich, or in Zurich, which uh, should be finished in, I don't know, 2030. Uh, we won this competition. It's a huge sport area with eight soccer fields, one soccer field on the roof, with, uh, with the hockey hall, with, some, uh, with many pools for championship, world championship, and we, I don't know if this is true, but the city of Zurich say this is the biggest sport building in Europe. I don't know, I don't, I, maybe with this mix of ice hockey and could be, I don't know, but, but it's big. <laughs> the, big is not so important, but it, it, I talk about scale up, you know, it's not at the end be the winner because it can be work in, in the city with other materials, can we come to other results? And is it possible to really to do public building without? If we can do that, we can do something against this CO2 balance. We really can use this earth material. So we have these earth cylinders, we have earth layers, but inside we have mostly wood construction. The wood construction we have big spams, which are 44 meters. It's on the tension again, which something is. I they told me it's new in in uh, in the tension construction. They know it more from uh, bridges and so, and not so much from inside. Maybe you know it better. Maybe you did it already <laughs> in your company. I don't know. But it's uh, on the tension. You see the tension idea goes now to wood. And we still use earth. And what we also integrate, of course, we have water tanks in. I will explain you why. And we have a PV roof. And I will explain you why. So we try to develop an integrated system. We want to use less uh, energy in the construction side for the building material, and we want to keep, protect the energy also 
on the operation energy that we bring that down to. So this is the, the big wood structure with the tension construction. The corner solutions are in concrete because the forces couldn't come around the corner on the wood, so we have to reinforce the corner. But it's a beautiful detail, but it's a little bit cement. And this is the structure with the outside pool, the children's pool, fun pool, the big spam, the jumping pool at the ice hockey field, double layer. And why an ice hockey field? Uh, because the city was a little bit relatively smart, because they know to produce ice you need electricity, and what then happens if you produce ice, you have a lot of heat. And the heat they, they produce with producing ice, they use to heat up the, the, the pools. So the idea was to have a circular system which you, need, which you can use the energy on both sides. And to produce the energy, um, the electricity, we put the PV roof on the top, to have the also energy for that. And then we found out that the problem is sometimes the Isaac key field produces more heat than the pools need. So we need a place to storage the energy, so we built these big tanks in these earth towers. Uh, so we, we, we calculate that we need mostly all of them. Some of them are pipes to bring the air away. And with this system, we came to that point that we don't need any heating system anymore. So it's a, a circular building which we completely, we, which are completely autark. So we have no heating system in this building. Yes. <laughs> Again, a heavy. Oops. Yeah. Oh. Quickly back. Uh huh. Oh. This slide is a problem, huh? which explains uh, the system. Yeah, this is our, uh, you know it from the, from the other project. Uh, here is, we store it, the heat, and this is the ISO key side. On the right side, on the left side is the pool side. And this system, together with the PV element on the top, protects the energy, and the result is that, which is, I don't know, this heavy mass with this technical element which are now PV element, not only cables, but producing energy together with this mass. Again, this dialogue with, with, between heaviness and lightness, the balance between the materials. This is something I believe, sometimes maybe we have the feeling this is like a, a little bit like Pompidou, but Pompidou has a lot of energy in it, in the, in the, and this is a little bit different, but still showing each element, adding elements, trying to create new answers. And, uh, and this was the result also in the model. So in the competition, we have to calculate everything that good that, it, that they allowed us to do these pipes, because, we, because these pipes was very important for the design. And the problem was, so it was a completely integrated process. We have more than 40 people working parallel on Zoom often uh, to make it possible to bring the numbers at the end for the architectural language to came true. Because the city has also a lot of engineers which calculate every project, and at the end it should really work. So we have to come in 12 weeks to the point that they say, yeah, it could be that, that you are right, that this is possible. And we came to the point and we won this competition. And yeah, some models, of course, PV element and this. And uh, yeah, we, we now is, uh, we, we work on that. And uh, it's already a big discussion in Zurich because it's around 400 million. It's, uh, it's a huge amount of money. And it's, um, there will be a public voting at the end if they really built that. But we did what we could uh, to make it as much as possible uh, yeah, ecological. You see these wood details with this, with this tension construction and coming to wood beams and then having a, a pool seat, which is the biggest span we have. Here, we, of course, we can use earth. The pool side, uh, the spirit, the, where, where the towers are, where you jump in. Again, a section we try to save energy in the basement that we reduced the relief, of course. Uh, the fun part. The Isaacy field, again with these beams, should be on the, I think the second category of Isaacy player should play there. And this is again the outside uh, look, newer renderings. And we did for the sport, for the soccer uh, fields, we did a little sport building also with PV element, 
Also in Earth, of course, it's easier, just one level high, so there we have not, no much problem. So this is probably the last one. It's, I don't know, this is a movie, if it works. <laughs> it works? Oh, yeah, it works. Yeah. So this is the end of my lecture. If you want to look, otherwise we can have a talk. Yeah. Practicant from Portugal who did that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we can start, I think. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Or we will do a break? No, I no, know. it's oh, fantastic. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I don't know if anyone wants to pose questions. I always find much more interesting when we start a dialogue with the audience. Yeah, so, I, think, yeah I think it's... <laughs> yeah, but, but let me tell you that I, di I really did like that. I was the guy who brought the bad news. And then <laughs> <laughs> Roger <laughs> proved that uh, we really have hope. And you gave many responses to the questions that I have posed with my presentation. And uh, yeah, it's, it was really enthusiastic. The way, um, Roger, I'm an architect who works intensively doing projects and building. And so I have, a, I have a, a very precise idea of the amount of work, or at least I, I think the amount of work behind the work of Roger and the risks you take, the way you accept that step by step you are reaching uh, a more competent solution, uh, even when, it's, when you, don't, you think that uh, it's not yet perfect, but uh, so it's a process, and it's, uh, it's fantastic, because it's, it's the only way uh, to respond to, the, to these moments. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's incredible because the, the language uh, emerges emerges uh, naturally from the process. It's not only a kind of aesthetic thing. It's uh, something that comes from that process. And um, the ethics, the ethics behind the decisions and the process. And I, I found this really beautiful and, and I have to congratulate you. Thank you very much. Because <laughs> you, you buy a lot of... Um, not um, and comfort to your daily, but uncertainty, which I think is fantastic. But um, I don't know if you want. I read one of your interviews when you talked about the relation with your team, that you say that it's a kind of horizontal structure. I really like that idea because <laughs> I, I think I have uh, the same system in my office and in the creative process it's important to have all the brains together contributing to um, to a solution mm -hmm. do, do you want to talk about that yeah absolutely as i if i was talking before about this 14 collaborating of course also my people from my office but you know if Normally you do a design and then you sort of, maybe 20 years ago you did the design and at the end you go to the engineers and ask them, can we do some PV somewhere? Uh, I didn't think about, maybe we can find a solution. Today uh, this project doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. You have to integrate all engineers, all specialists from the beginning, mm -hmm. otherwise it just don't work or the numbers doesn't ca ca uh, count or the design is not good. So I need the knowledge of everyone and I have to be completely flexible in this process to integrate. He needs a note to, to print, bring the, the, the beams, otherwise it doesn't work in this band. You need a good design also, which is also very important. We, we, we talk a lot about numbers, 
today, but at the end it should be also a good design because a good design survive probably a little bit longer because the people has a relation and they like it. And, and this means to integrate everybody, and I'm always completely open to good ideas. I, I, at the end, I, it doesn't matter who has the good idea, for yeah. it just have to come together, and we, we need all them. And this is also something, if we work with this aspect of climate, it's another way of designing. It's more integrating very early everybody to come to another honest language, not start with an idea and add at the end things which you never can add anymore because you didn't think about that at the beginning. So mm -hmm. this is, if you want to go with circular ideas and so, we have to know more. We are probably generalists, but we have to need the knowledge from all experts and all mm -hmm. partners in the office. And it's really a collaboration. And at the other hand, it's something we don't know, often we don't know the answers. It's yeah. not that you have references, you know, you, and then you need a dialogue to come to a point. So it's a really an integrated process, which is uh, different, I would say, to before, because the complexity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is enormous. You know, this is really an enorm, enormous complexity at the end with this project. You know, this is amazing what you have to know. You know? And we still fight in every, every moment to make it possible. Every step brings new question. And also, uh, the city was uh, uh, this summer where you start to be afraid about certain details. So we have to do a lot of tests. We have to do beams tests. We have to do earth tests So with the ETH again. So we again work with the ETH together with my chair, with other chairs, with the Professor Frangi from ETH Zurich to make it possible. Uh, so this is a really a big uh, research thing, and this is again very flat, you know, and we need every piece. So it's like that, and I think it's different. Yeah, uh, I, w I was remember re remembering and uh, um, a book that I read, Creativity. It was uh, written by Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull was the founder of Pixar. Pixar. Uh, that that uh, with Toy Story started a long path of success, and he wrote this marvelous book about um, the creative process inside Pixar, and it's uh, to me it was so familiar with architecture um, production, but in a sense that I really like. And when I wrote your uh, when I read your your interview, it came to my mind that um, interaction between everyone without, there is no coordinator, there is no partner, there is no intern. Every, from all the, par every single part, every single architect can come up something that is really important to, so that we make the bet the, the better, a better decision. And um, to, to me, it's clear. I, I think that, um, and of course, including the other disciplines, because in complex times like today, it's, I think that the architects must, uh, must, uh, must be humble to understand. It's not, maybe it's not a question of being humble. It's a question of being intelligent <laughs> and, to, um, and to get what they can get from the other disciplines so that we put together uh, the most intelligent response in each context. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really interesting to see how do you step by step, project by project, the, um, the capacity to respond with these unusual techniques uh, grow and grow and grow and become more solid. Yes, you speak about the scale, the importance of the big scale. Yes, we need to scale because otherwise uh, these uh, techniques in the end or these technologies are not going to be important in um, replacing our current, rec uh, current um, reality and we need to replace it W replace it with other responses. So we need scale. We need scale. And it, we know that it's so difficult to replace the current uh, reality because industries, constructors, 
and um, the guys who define regulations and so on. Um, besides um, laziness, there is, uh, an, uh, I would say, almost opposition to things that are new. It's very difficult to, to come up with new possibilities. So I believe that you, you, you explain the projects always smiling, like you're having fun, but I, I can imagine the huge uh, level of problems uh, that you face trying to um, convince clients, institutions, constructors, and um, what, what, what um, is your understanding of the, the availability of constructors in general, the ones you have worked with, to this kind of um, uh, new, tech, new possibilities? Do they, they resist? Do they, they feel unsafe? They feel that they are not going to get the money that they want in the end of the construction? Uh, mm, I'm not sure if I understood the question right. Um, maybe you've... Yes, the question, the main question is that when we start, um, we start a, start a, a construction, yeah. we have a, a constructor, a company that is going to build. Yeah. And I would say that the majority of companies that I've yeah. worked with mm. are really suspicious about uh, yeah. This kind of inventions, mm. te techniques yeah. that are not uh, no. common, that they have to find yeah. uh, some yeah. other workers yeah. with uh, other skills and yeah. so on. Yeah, it's it's a problem, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, I have many good friends uh, in the in the building industry, which helps me. So, Erne is one of these. I know. So, I have friends which are. Uh, and I try to involve them from the beginning to make them um, thinking positive about these details. But we also, um, I'm close to this uh, startup Lemac, mm -hmm. which is a young uh, earth company. Uh, Felix Hilgert is the guy who I show you the schema. He, do this, I would say right now, is one of the important earth building company. It's a small one, but he has a, a lot of lo knowledge. And uh, I work with him, I'm very close. He's also in my research program, he's an assist at ETH. And if we come to the site and, and we tell the construction company we want to ram, mm -hmm. I bring my partners with me and say, I, we show you how, we can, how you can do that. So I do okay. even more than just design. I, I collaborate with, with people which know how to build, mm -hmm. and I bring this knowledge to, the, to this company. Okay. Now we collaborate with, with, uh, with, uh, with the brick company, which do another earth wall. So there's a collaboration of Lemark and uh, the brick company, which don't want to burn anymore. It's also one of the, the biggest brick company in, in Switzerland, which try to do something now with earth. So it's always not only planning, it's also helping the company to come to the, to the, the point that they, do, they, they believe that they can do it. So th this is more than just uh, design, it's helping to develop. And I, of course, I, re I use the research pool of ETH if you have the research at ETH for these beams behind this construction, the company, the, earth, the, the wood company, believes more that they can build it. Mm -hmm. Because right now, they don't know this structure, and not in Switzerland, so we, have, we need the research in the school to bring it back. So what I do is a, it's a really a big uh, thing. I prepare when I, when I do... Uh, uh, ask the, the, the workers to, to build it. I already have some research behind and I, I, I scribe it down and, and yeah. bring them how they can do that. And then it's possible to go. But at the end, uh, you know, this uh, monastery, we want to do it in earth. They didn't believe us, so we have, we have to downscale the mixture. So we have to do a much easier mixture with more energy, less than concrete. But we also have that, that we have always a plan B. <laughs> also in the, uh, in the building here uh, in Zurich, we probably have to do the base in chalk and then 
going up to the to air construction because they say we are afraid in the if you have a lot of water that earth is not the perfect material so we have to stabilize so we always have a plan b to to make it a little bit simpler so we already know, we didn't tell them but we we know we this question will come so we we need the answer so yeah. this is what we do to try to go close and at at the end collaborate with the industry and make them ready to to make our building yeah. and this is a uh, it's also yeah, many of them are friends of mine, and, um, and, and so they, and they all want to do something yeah. positive, so you integrate them from the beginning. So the project is the whole, pro the whole process. Yeah. It's not only doing yeah. the drawings yeah. of a building, it's now, the whole process. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. you have to do things uh, which are out far away from that what an architect normally do. Yeah. yeah. You were talking before you were talking about the project, you were looking for a label for it to be uh, financially interesting for the, for the client. And my question is whether have you ever, I mean, you're explaining that some of your projects were cut because of the fear of some clients to, uh, to build in such a way maybe they found it was too radical. Have you ever been like kind of cut in uh, just because someone somebody was trying to achieve a label, some certain label, and they wouldn't get like uh, financially where they had to go, where they wanted to go, just, I mean, just because of that, of, of wanting to get a, lab, a label, not because of, of being mm. scared of, of this thing not working in terms of... Uh, no, uh, we, we didn't, uh, labels, they never stop us at the end. So we always find a way to, to do separate research in schools to, to show the labels to resp the people who are responsible for the that it's possible if you calculate in this way, this way. So again, you re and then you bring them to the point that they accept, they find always a little, some points somewhere <laughs> if they have believed our oh, construction is there, and then they have another material which, which they can do in relation. So we never had a problem with labels. And uh, because we didn't get the labels, at the end we get the labels. But the problem was often at the beginning, the labels was not ready for our answer. So I'm not, because the labels are only that smart, what, what the common sense is, the com state of the art. This, no, this is the, the knowledge of the labels. They don't know if you, do, if you are innovative. The label doesn't know the new answer. So how they calculate, they could, they're not able to calculate it because they just don't know. It's, clear, in, it's in a way normal or it's clear uh, that you, when you are very in, innovative, you have to, in a way, to redo the label that you get the number to integrate. So we always found a way to come to a point or at the end, uh, no, the, 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 the labels went with us because at the very end, the labels wants to support this project. But at the very beginning, the Haas Rauch was a problem, really a problem to get the money because, yeah, we need, uh, need one school behind, we need uh, two engineers until Martin, because at the beginning was the question if you have enough money to build without this support. And in Austria, it's a, I think it's around 20%. So it was really a question if we can build or not. He start to build without knowing exactly if he get the money. At the end, he get, he get it, but at the beginning it was not clear. But at the end, I have to say it, and no label ever stop us. No. But I'm a little bit critic with labels at the end, you know, it's, but, yeah, yeah the, the, the idea behind these labels are, in general, a positive thing, yeah. But it's clear that they can't know everything, yeah. ¿Alguien tiene otra pregunta? Uh, thank you very much, uh, both for the presentation. Uh, I have a question for you, Herr Bolzhauser. Um, what do you think um, is like the realistic uh, potential of rammed earth, also like in, in architecture of the city? Uh, looking at uh, the cost of building uh, with rammed earth and like, uh, for example, the thickness you have to, you have to build in. And um, 
uh, do you think maybe the potential of Adobe blocks could be bigger? Uh, I don't know how it's in Switzerland, but in Germany no, you can, since like some months you can uh, build like three stories high only by, five. Five. in Switzerland five? Yeah, we, we came to five <laughs> okay. already. No, okay. yeah, but it's true. But the first thing is, I talk about Ramadur construction. This is only one way of using Earth. Of course, Adobe, there are loam plates, loam plaster, loam uh, hybrid with wood. So there are many ways, also many tradition, or we, can, we call it Weller technique. This is a German technique. It's a mixture of straw and loam. You build different, you build like that, and then you cut the walls. You can't build that high, but it's another technique. So there are many techniques, and there is also techniques of printing now in school and, and, and pressing. So there are also different techniques. This is liquid loam is now a research program I teach it. So earth, probably we don't know today how we really use earth in the future because there's so many research uh, about earth now. And Martin Rauch always said after starting to build with concrete and steel 150 years ago, there was no research anymore about earth. So we still have this gap to fill up. So we believe this is if you talk about steel, or probably not steel, but brick and, and concrete, we believe, and, and plaster or, or gips, I don't know, gips in English is? Gips, yeah, which has a lot of energy. We believe 30% to 40% is easier to deplace with earth-based earth material. And uh, the aspect of costs, of course, ramid earth wall is as a double price right now than a concrete wall. If you do earth blocks in the, as, a, as a prefabricated element, you bring the price down. If you do little adobe blocks, if you, it's even cheaper. You around 10, 50%, 20%. So uh, this is also something we should do. We have to find out how to make it payable. But on the other hand, the energy uh, we use for concrete or uh, brick, you know, you don't have to pay the insurance now, the CO2 in insurance for this material. This material should be uh, even more expensive and then mm -hmm. is earth a little mm -hmm. bit less expensive. Mm -hmm. This is also something we should regulate in the future, okay. what it means if you use material with a lot of CO2, what it means if you use material which it has less, and we have to do a lot of yeah. work with earth, you know, to find a way in many ways, uh, combination with wood, I don't know. And then I think we come to the point that uh, we can reduce 30, 40% of, of all the materials with this material. Okay. I can one one more question. Uh, uh, is it uh, possible to do an internship in your uh, architecture <laughs> office? <laughs> yes, we, uh, <laughs> we have... Uh, <laughs> I only wanted to Give you comment address, your so question. <laughs> no, no. I want to comment your question because you, I believe that you started asking if it's uh, uh, it's going to be possible to introduce this technology inside the cities um, because of the, the the price, and of course these are ancestral tech, tech, tech technologies, but um, in the in the way they are put in practice by Roger, becomes inno innovation. And um, we all know that innovative technologies, at first, are, are more expensive. But when they start to be utilized and utilized and so on, they become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So it's a long process. And Roger um, mentioned one aspect, is that to compensate uh, the difference of levels of costs, and I, I spoke ab about that also. The states must, uh, must introduce what is called green taxes to compensate the costs. So this kind of highly sustainable technologies must be supported and must, must be given incentives by the states. So this is the way, like a, an electric car. An electric car now is expensive, but it's becoming cheaper less expensive, less expensive, and one day in the future, I would say in 10 years, it's going to be uh, more or less cheap or cheaper. Uh, in, the, in these cases, is the, the same. 
or you say the concrete death, you have to pay an insurance because you need a lot of energy yeah. to produce concrete or bricks. Yeah. This is the reason why this guy from the brick factory starts to do unburned brick. He wants to learn how to do that and to collaborate because you know this insurance will come in the future and then his business will come down. Yeah, if he yeah, has yeah. no answer with another material, he's out. So uh, this is the other way that you say, okay, you have to, pay. it's like petrol. If you have yeah, the prices goes up, you have to pay insurance, and if you are, then you can also about the, the state or the other way around is also possible, I think. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, um, both of your talks. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Roger, uh, I think Jose referred at some point that um, durability in buildings is also considered uh, at a certain extent also sustainable and there's certainly an argument for um, concrete or certain concrete structures um, to be uh, the ones that have the biggest lifespan and can be interchangeable and um, uh, uh, dismantled easily and so on. There can be an argument to say that there are actually sustainable ways of construction. So I wanted to ask you, uh, given the limited data that there is in ramped earth in these newer buildings, how does it as a material sort of matches up against concrete that seems to last very long? What's the lifespan of, of these buildings? I show you a building which are more than 300 years old. Uh, we, I didn't know m concrete building which are that old. <laughs> um, yes, I think at the end, uh, air construction could be the oldest I know in Europe they are around 800, 900 years. So it's more the way how you protect the construction, how you deal with that. So I would say if you do it in the right way, it's, it's nearly similar. But on the other hand, yeah, if you want to have a solid just structure, then use it, use the concrete just where it is necessary and then use other materials that you, I think, a smart combination. But in general, I would say, I, I, I couldn't say that the earth construction are less, can live less long than a concrete construction, but it has, you, you need a, a big knowledge about how to construct. And maybe at the very end, because I show all my uh, earth construct, I like to show it because I like materials, but if you plaster it, no problem. Also, then it's, say, this may be a little bit less ego, ego <laughs> about that, what you do, a little bit more relaxed about earth. If you plaster it, it, it stays long. It's really, and you have also not much to do with the facade. So I would say then you're close to a brick building, or I don't know. Uh, I found some funny, interesting in in France. They did uh, they, on the weather side. They did plaster, and then the sunny side. They, they showed you a construction. Yeah. So it's really interesting to go to the, to the also in Spain. I would also like to go in Spain to see all your earth building, how they did it, in the tradition. So that that you find many smart answers also, <laughs> and inspirations to go on. Yeah. No. Bueno. Algún comentario más por vuestra parte? Any other comment from your side? That's it. <laughs> okay. Bueno, pues entonces creo que podemos dar por finalizada la sesión. Muchas gracias a todos por venir y quizá pasamos un momento a explicar por parte del equipo qué es este artefacto y cuáles son las acciones que hemos hecho en Rizoma a lo largo de este... El que quiera, el que quiera, obviamente. Y si no, pues muchas gracias por venir.